Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Mitchell. I'm originally from Moose Jaw and now live in Saskatoon. And the Festival of Words is one of the best parts of my summer. This year is a little different, but I'm still happy as ever to be among readers and writers and really excited for today's session. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 4 and that this festival is located <laughs> on Treaty 4 territory. The original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honour the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we are committed to move forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. The festival is dedicated to making this a safe space for everyone. Any hateful language will not be tolerated in the events or in the chat on YouTube. Also, this festival would not be possible without the support of our major funders, so we would like to thank the Saskatchewan Arts Board, SAS Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, and the Government of Canada, as well as a long list of program funders that will be shown at the end of this event. If you're in a business that you know supports the festival, please be sure to thank them for their support. And uh, I'll now introduce uh, our first author today. Miranda Endicott is a well-known author who has lived in at least five provinces in Canada. Her novels, including Good to a Fault, The Little Shadows, and The Difference, have won and been nominated for several awards in Canada. Before turning to writing, Endicott had a career as an actor and director. Though she claims to not be a playwright, the Canadian Encyclopedia describes how her theatre experience adds to her writing. Uh, and I quote, her novels contain a theatrical sensibility seen in her illumination of characters in her lives as she subtly explores the intersection of their dreams and realities. If you're interested in hearing more about this illumination of the inner and outer lives of characters, Endicott has a workshop coming up on Friday afternoon here at the festival called Inners and Outers. Please welcome Marina Endicott. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm going to read from The Difference, um, close to the beginning. After the death of their father, the principal of a residential school at Blade Lake, Alberta, Kay has come with her older half sister Thea, to Nova Scotia, where Thea is going to marry Francis, the sea captain to whom she's been engaged for 10 years. The plan is for Kay to live with an aunt, while Thea and Francis go off on their honeymoon voyage to Shanghai on the clipper ship, the morning light, but the plan changes. Here they are on board ship the first night after dinner. Dinner was short, both Thea and Francis wanting nothing after summer pudding, but to sit talking before the stove a little while. The skylight was still open, though the night had turned cooler. They spoke softly to each other, a word or two rather than sentences. Kay was not one of them. She ought not to be there at all. She went to the piano at the other end of the saloon and played a little, soft Chopin etudes that would not make a dent in their solitude. Before very long, Thea got up from the armchair and said that Kay should find her bunk and the sea air, and Francis said, yes, yes, what a long day this has been for a young lady on her first voyage. So there was nothing to do but acquiesce and leave them. The stewardess came to set a tin of hot water in her little wash basin and showed Kay where to stow the tin on a hook below the basin when she was done, and where the pan hid, for if one did not want to go along to the head, as they called the toilet closet on a ship, in one's nightgown. The cabin was satisfyingly trig and trim. Dark wood boards fit tight together made the walls, curved as the ship's wall was curved, and the last of the August twilight glimmered in through the port, a thick, round, bolt-fastened window over the bunk. The feather bed was tucked up taut with a blue wool blanket, and above it ran a shelf with short walls for a book and a small lamp. She got a lecture from Lena, the stewardess, which she did not need at all, having had one from Francis twice, on how one could only have a lamp in a calm sea and on putting out the flame very carefully. Kay did not mind being lectured to at first when it was only when people ought to know that she would know that she grew irritable. Lena gave her a pat on the knee saying she was already a great sailor and they would soon have her in the Navy, speaking as if she was a child still. 
At last Thea came and kissed Kay's cheek and left, her blue skirt filling the, the door and emptying out into the corridor to go back to Francis, who was her husband now, shutting the door behind her. You must learn to close doors on a ship. Alone in her bunk, Kay stared sightless at the wooden ceiling, recounting her life so far, putting it into language. I have bad dreams, I cannot be left. She was afraid to dream here in case Francis put her off at the nearest port because it had happened before. At Orchard House, Aunt Lydia Wetmore's spreading white villa back in Yarmouth. Then there had been such a clanging and a whispering and the sacred telephone being used to ring up and summon Thea so that she harnessed Auntie Bob's pair herself and drove the wagon out from Yarmouth town at five in the morning before the trolley car began to get out to Lake Milo. Kay had not slept since waking the house by shouting with the nightmare but had dressed herself and sat stiff as a mummy on the top stair waiting for punishment or something worse. She felt darkness as huge as a bear inside her eating and eating becoming larger. Hearing the wagon's arrival, Kay had got up her courage to go downstairs. Aunt Lydia's daughter Olive stood bandy-legged in the front hall, staring at Thea with her pale fish eyes almost popping out, her upper lip strangely trembling. It is too much, Theodora, too, too much. You cannot expect us to, and forest away too, and the house in an uproar, an uproar, and mother. Mother did not sleep one wink last night fish in the eye, rabbit in the lip, light hair frizzed over her ears, Kay found Olive very ugly and was glad that she was not related to her at all because she was Thea's cousin on her mother's side and Kay had had a different mother who was not from this stupid place. It was not so bad, Kay told Thea in her bedroom as they packed her trunk again. I woke up in the upstairs hall, that's all. I had been shouting a little. What were you dreaming? Kay did not want to say. The bare trees were coming down to the shore like bones walking and we had to run, I had to warn them. Thea bent to look under the mahogany bed. Where's the blue valise? The attic, I think, and Lydia said it was too old and should be put away. Well, run and get it. Kay hesitated because the attic was full of webs with damp sifted dust furred over everything, but she could hear, could not bear Thea to reproach her for cowardice. And the valise had belonged to her own mama, Eliza Warner Ward, and she did not want to leave it in this house. She went, treading carefully only on the strips of carpet and never on the black walnut boards of the floor, and found the door that led upstairs again and the heavy bake light switch for the single bulb. Then up again, core matting on the narrow attic stairs, sharp under her stocking toes, into the lofty space under the roof. The light was dim so early, but there tucked under the eaves was her valise, EWW in gold letters on the side, still clean because Kay had only arrived yesterday morning. The only clear, clean thing in this blurred space. The valise's black bone handle fit her hand. The attic was only dusty, not haunted. The rope dangling from one rafter was not a noose, or at least not a noose for a person. Then they all said she must leave Aunt Lydia, who was not Kay's own aunt, but Thea's mother's oldest sister, out at Lake Milo and go into Auntie Bob, the youngest sister, who could use a girl to run and fetch for her. Terrible prospect at the Grey House with the, the tower on Parade Street in town. All afternoon at the Grey House, they sat with Thea in the round front parlour at the bottom of the tower. Aunt Lydia and Cousin Olive, Aunt Queen, the middle sister, and little Auntie Bob, all speaking in low voices as if that meant that Kay, huddled on the window seat, could not hear them. Aunt Lydia and Aunt Queen said again that they had no patience with father, nor with their sister for being so determined to throw away everything civilised and trek out to the wilderness with him for all the good it had done either one. It was a foolish venture, and if he was so determined to help the Indians, surely he could have found some nearer to home. Thea reminded them that father had sent her home to go to normal school, as he promised. It was only to be expected he might marry again, being widowed so early, and history be went on being retold. So Kay looked at the raindrops on the curving window and found two to follow down the pane in the slowest race imaginable. And the ants began telling Thea about boarding schools in Nova Scotia, where Kay might be very happy. School was what Kay was not allowed to talk about, or what could only be talked about in a certain way. And she sat growing cold while they discussed nourishing meals, 
teaching philosophy and suitable study for young ladies such as home economy or Pittman's course in shorthand. The ants talked on as the room grayed into evening, no fire lit to cheer them no matter how chill the rain because it was August, about difficult eventualities and 12 years old, oh dear me. At last, Aunt Queen brought her mouth into a line and pushed the bottom lip out and said that hospital treatments had been found efficacious for... <clears throat> At that, Thea stood up so sharply that the tea cart jittered across the shining floor. She put her hand out to Kay. Please excuse us, she said to the ants. I must give Kay her drops. Mastoiditis, murmured Auntie Bob, who did not often align with the sisters against them. Thea shook her head without looking back. Only the earache. She has a proclivity. Kay said nothing. Anything she said would be wrong. Thea bustled with the drops and made Kay get straight into her nightgown, although it was only six in the evening and they had not even had their supper, and turned down the coverlet on the cot Auntie Bob had put up in the dressing room and knelt beside her to say prayers. She kissed Kay and said, We've not been happy for a long time, but now we will be. The night and day had been so jolting that without wanting to, Kay slept. In the cool darkness of the Yarmouth night, Thea heard her sister gasp, then a tight impending silence. She slid her feet from the quilt and darted across to the cot and touched Kay's face to wake her. All right, dear heart, she said, all's well, just a dream, just a dream. Kay's eyes were open, but she was not seeing this room at Auntie Bob's. She looked frantically to the wall and away and back again, staring. After a minute, she whispered, I try not ever to think about things, but sometimes I can't help it, Thetty. I think it will escape and I will break open bleeding and die or run away and lose you. And leave me, you mean. Yes, but then I would lose you too. I will always find you. You could not find Annie when she ran away. Thea saw again the bent form beneath bare branches. Too late. Do not leave me, Kay begged her. Thea opened the bed covers and climbed in beside her sister in the narrow bed. No, no, I will not leave you. I will never leave you or lose you or let you be hurt, she said, murmuring and whispering into Kay's ear, into her hair and the nape of her neck as Kay turned in the cot and gradually her shuddering stilled. At breakfast next morning, Thea announced that Kay would not stay with Auntie Bob either. There was nothing for it, but Kay must sail with them. Someone, it was Auntie Bob, the one Kay had almost liked, said that some might say it was a sad thing to have a younger sister tagging along on a honeymoon, especially one 10 years awaited. That was also Kay's fault, although nobody said so, because Thea had had to come out west to care for her after her mother died. Anyway, Thea and Frances had had a proper honeymoon in Halifax four months before when they first arrived, when they were first married, and Kay had first been sent to stay alone with Aunt Lydia. She had kept her dreams clamped up that time. There was only one day left before the morning light was to leave, not enough time to assemble her kit, but Thea took Kay down Main Street to Milady's up-to-date shop for boots with soft soles that would not skitter on the deck. Thea mourned the lack of a better clothier, but Kay yanked her braid so hard her neck hurt and said her midi blouse was fine if she was to be a sailor. She was afraid of being on the boat, the ship, she must always say, but she would not let them see that. Not the forests or the wet moors or hateful old Aunt Lydia, not Thea or Francis. Francis did not look at her askance. He nodded as to a sailor he was taking on, said he had a cabin saved for just such eventuality, although she would have to sleep with a crate of china at one end of the bunk. Thea laughed and put her hand on Kay's arm and said, no such thing, it was only his joke. I meant on the way home, of course, Francis said, his eyes calm. We don't take china to China. That would be calls to Newcastle. But they do not want a child with them. They want to be by themselves. It was foolish to think that, by themselves, because the ship was so full of people, almost all of them men, some very rough at that. So there was another lecture from Thea about whom Kay was and was not to speak to. The crew was lined up to greet them that morning when they first came aboard. The tall, thin first mate, Mr. Wright, stout little bosun with a strong black beard, the third mate with thin pinkish hair who was a gentleman from England come down in the world. She did not remember their names, but Thea had a list to study from. The huge second mate frightened Kay. His beet-red nose, 
terribly pocked from some old disease, had grown beyond the usual to take up most of his face. She looked too closely and, and then wished she had not and feared he was angry to be stared at. Then they met Hubbard the steward and his wife Lena, who would see to her and Thea, and the rest of the crew and the cook, down to the least idler, the ship's carpenter, Seaton, who was very old and lay smoking his pipe in the lifeboat when Francis did not shout at him. And the ship's boys, three of them, George and Jackie, and the shy youngest boy with light brown eyes who smiled at Kay, Arthur Wetmore from Port Maitland, one of Thea's hundred cousins, whose father had known Kay's own father before he died. Arthur leaned against the foremast to talk to her until he was shouted for because he was new himself, only on his second voyage. So now she knew that the bitter end of the rope goes in the scupper when making the ballantine coil of three circles in a piling, untwisting, circling, round, round. Roused by some change in the rocky movement of her bunk, Kay woke. She had been asleep after all, not dreaming. She lay quiet, but the change in motion gave her a galvanized wakefulness that could not be ignored. The porthole only showed blank darkness. Kay pushed back the blankets and stood, careful with the rolling, to pull on her skirt and shawl over her nightdress and slip bare feet into her new brown boots. The cabin door opened without creaking. She shut it carefully, silently, and made her way along the dark corridor to the stairs and up to the deck, like a cat creeping out to look out except a cat could not hold so tight to the handrail, onto the deck. Everything was moving. Great swells raised the ship and sent it cracking and creaking down and forward, forward. As she came up on the deck, the wind caught her hair and her skirt, so her bare legs felt the bite above her boots before she lifted her head to the tempest. But it was no tempest, it was only speed. The ship was scudding fast through the darkness, everything bent forward, an italic hand racing over miles of blue-black paper sea. Sails filled the air around her, ropes taut, now shining, because now the blackness of the night was broken in a blaze of moon beating down through the sails. The clouds had parted and the moon, the moon, full, splendid, huge, the beauty of it. She was confounded turned from a frightened, whining cat into a much larger thing, an angel of awareness. Beauty, beauty, beauty. She wept with it for a moment and then left off, merely accepting. The wind of their going lifted her hair and ballooned the sleeves of her nightdress. Along the port side of the ship came the second mate, lurching around the wheelhouse. He was the one who had frightened Kay that morning, only that morning at the dock in Yarmouth with his blood-coloured bulbous nose and shambling gait. But now, in the rush of the elements, in the star-jangling wind of the night, and the full moon shining ahead of them, he came rolling up beside her and said, loud enough to be heard over the wind, Isn't it marvellous, miss? She looked up to his small eyes and scurfy straw hair, his nose receding in importance in this elemental air. Grinning like a great fool, he said, Isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? to ride before the wind on a night with a moon. Kay nodded and nodded, yes. Yes, beautiful. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marina. That was lovely. And I I was just thinking about, uh, I've been listening to The Difference on audiobook and it's lovely there too, but there's nothing like hearing an author read their own work. So that was a real treat. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to introduce our uh, next author in a moment, um, but just to let people know, we will be uh, taking time for questions after both authors have read. So uh, if you have questions, um, you can put them uh, in the Q&A and we will uh, get as many as we can. So uh, DM Bitson is a friendly acquaintance of mine, and I had the pleasure of attending her book launch in Saskatoon for her book Wide Open that she'll be reading from today. It's an important and challenging memoir about her experiences as a survivor of sexual assault and her recovery from the related trauma. DM has been very generous in sharing her own story, uh, not only in her book, but in countless media interviews in the months after it came out. 
And when Cotto Books, the publisher of Wide Open, closed nine months after the book came out, Ditson was also one of the main media commentators on the closure of that longtime Saskatchewan publisher. Her advocacy with and for sexual assault survivors, first time authors, small publishers, the arts, and more make her an important voice in Saskatchewan's literary community and one that we can expect to hear from more uh, in the coming years. And I should say Canada's literary community because I know DM is living uh, out of province. So please welcome DM Ditson. Thank you, Tracy. That was, that was very kind. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in for the online festival. Um, I'm grateful to be here with you and to share about my experiences. As Tracy mentioned, my, my story is about sexual assault, post-traumatic stress disorder, and recovery. I feel like it's basically my story of how I got better. Um, so I'm aware that these are really difficult topics. This is pretty tricky subject matter. And so if you would like, if it becomes too difficult for you to, to continue listening, then I would suggest maybe you just put me on mute for a bit and then wait for another face to come up on your screen. Uh, I think it's really important for people to take care of themselves. So um, do, what, do what it is that you need. So today I'm going to share with you a few passages from throughout my book. So it gives you an overview of my story. Um, so the first thing that you need to know about me in order to understand my story and the context of it is that I was raised very evangelical Christian. So I used to memorize Bible verses for fun and then and then go and compete on it. And I was very, very good at it. I went to nationals a couple times and it was it was something I really loved doing. And then I also went on a few missions trips as well. When I was 17, I began questioning my faith. And I went on a youth retreat at that point to reconnect with God. And that is the first passage that I'll share with you today. I miss God, ache for him. I don't know where he's been lately, but I need to find him. I go to the chapel. The hallway is long and dark, like a lonely night sky before the sun rushes in. I'm going to kneel at the altar to beg God to take me back. The wooden chapel door is closed. I turn the handle, but it's locked. I pray for it to open. I yank the handle and crank on it some more. I fling myself against the door. It won't open. It's locked and solid, refusing my pleas. I know what this means. God doesn't want me. He doesn't love me anymore. Maybe he never did. I collapse in a blubbering heap and lie pressed up against the door for ages. A leader finds me. I'm sobbing so hard I can't answer her questions. She leaves and sends Pastor John down the hall toward me. He's carrying a box of tissues, as though that could help when the God of heaven and earth turns his back on you. Come here, he says, and leads me to a quiet room that's littered with chairs. What's going on? The door's locked, I say, words sputting out like grasshoppers hitting the windshield. The chapel door. I wanted to go and pray, but God is closed to me. You're being ridiculous, he says. God is always here for you if you want him. I shake my head. Get up, he says, and stands before me. I weigh a million pounds, but I pull myself up and cross my arms tight to keep my insides from spilling out. Stand on the couch, he says. Huh? You heard me. I step onto the faded couch and turn to face him. I'm so confused that my tears have stopped. Close your eyes, he says. I do. I wobble and put my arms out to steady myself. Good. Now trust in God and jump off. I stand perched on the edge, ready to take a leap of faith, but my feet are pressing hard into the cushions. Jump, I tell myself, I can't. I'm frozen like a statue, a pillar of salt. Pastor John takes my hand, pulls a little and says, I've got you, step off the side. Then, irritated, just open your eyes and step down. I open my eyes, it's nothing, only a foot down to the carpet. But even that is too far. I won't do it. I stand quaking on the threadbare couch. Like God, like everyone else, eventually Pastor John gives up and leaves. God isn't who he's supposed to be. Not my heavenly father or best friend or beloved. He doesn't care to save me. He wouldn't even, let me, he wouldn't even open the door to let me bow down before him. Jesus said a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. That's why I can't do anything right. All I am is rot, a tree to cut down and throw into the fire. 
And if God is real, why isn't he always in my heart and everywhere else too? I stand on the edge of that couch forever until all my beliefs tumble down. So the next passage I'll share with you is from about six months later, and you'll notice a pretty substantial difference in me. I'm on the bus to Regina from Portage La Prairie. I spent the last two months selling magazine subscriptions across the prairies, but I quit, sort of. I didn't make a single sale yesterday, so I pulled the plug before my boss could do it for me. We've been driving an hour or so when the driver makes a stop in Brandon. I leave my backpack on the window seat and go to find a vending machine. When I get back on the half empty bus, I pause, confused. Why is that guy in my row? He sees me frowning. I dart my eyes away. Hi, he says, you in here? I nod and he stands looming over me. He's huge, a head taller than I am, older and black. I squeeze past to the window seat. Sorry, I mumble when I brush his sleeve. I'm Jimmy, he says, just like on my hat. I look up, sure enough, his white ball cap proclaims his name in rhinestones. Mind if I sit here, he asks, after we're settled in. It's all right, I say, but it's not. His thigh is over the dividing line, threatening to touch mine. I scooch away. So, you're going to Regina, he asks, as the bus pulls onto the highway. I nod. What's there for you? Home, I shrug. I don't have any plans. Well, a smart, pretty girl like you must have a lot of options. I blush. I guess I don't mind sharing my seat. Do you live in Brandon, I ask. Jimmy nods, holding my gaze until I have to look away. Holy is he intense. I like Brandon, I blurt, filling the unbearable silence. I was there a few weeks ago, selling magazines door to door. Did you know there's a bar where they scan your ID to see if it's legit? Luckily, I could use my real ID since the drinking age is 18 here. Which bar is that? Jimmy asks. I don't know, it had blue lights. That's not much to go on. Did I tell you I'm a nightclub promoter? If you get me the name, I can get you a job there. Really? Sure, and you could live with me, Jimmy says, as though he's offering a piece of gum. No rent or anything. What? Are you my fairy godmother? I can read people. I already know you're good. You do? I do. A slow smile spreads across his face. I search his eyes. They smile. He really does know me. But no rent? That's weird. Jimmy laughs. I guess it is, huh? But it'd be nice to have some company. I don't really need the cash. What's a rich guy doing on the bus? I'm not into driving alone. I like meeting people. The prairies race by. Is this creepy or awesome? I don't know, I say. Your choice. You'd have your own room and everything, Jimmy says. Maybe it sounds crazy, but I like helping people. I'd want to pay something. See, I knew you were a sweetheart. How's a hundred bucks a month? Maybe, I say softly. A job, a place, a savior. It'd be so easy. Hey, look, he whispers a moment later, his breath warm in my ear. The girls I sold magazines with were right. That is kind of nice. Jimmy gestures to a couple across from us. I could go for some of that. They have a blanket over their laps. The blanket is moving. Are they hiding a puppy? Oh, no, definitely not. I gasp and whip my face back to the window. I don't know what they're doing, but I wish it would stop. I'm hot and cold, shivery. I feel gross, as if I haven't brushed my teeth in weeks, as if I'm covered in bug spray and camping sweat. I imagine a natcha sketch. Wipe it clean. Take a breath. What kind of ice cream do you like? Jimmy asks. Huh? Had forgotten he was there. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? Chocolate, I say. I like chocolate everything. Interesting, he replies smoothly. I'm into vanilla. Vanilla? That's so boring. Jimmy runs his thumb across my cheek. His touch is a surprise, but it's so tender, so warm that I melt right into it. He laughs. It's what I like. You're what I like. My head tilts toward him, a stalk of wheat in the breeze. We're already in Regina, almost at the bus station, almost back in my empty old life. Do you really mean it? About me moving in, I ask? Absolutely. The bus pulls into the station. Mum and Dad are standing next to the old gray van, kangaroos waiting to shove me back into the pouch. Those are my parents. Wish I could meet them, but I gotta run, Jimmy says as he gathers his things. He passes me a black business card. Call me when you decide. He weaves his way to the front of the bus before it stops rolling. He's first in line. The moment the door opens, he disappears. So I thought Jimmy was a nice guy. Thought he was 
I thought he was super, <laughs> just being really kind. Um, but I learned later that he was actually a pimp. And I didn't move in with him due to a series of fortunate coincidences. And nothing bad happened between him and me. But I wanted to share that story because it shows how vulnerable I was and how I was easy prey for the men who would later choose to harm me. So I'm not going to take you today through the sexual assault that broke my brain and left me with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but I will share an encounter I had with that man um, before he assaulted me. So in this passage, I'm 18 years old. This is again a few more months after meeting Jimmy on the bus. In my first semester of university, my theater prof puts me in a group with the older girls who sit a few seats older. Tanya, who's 22, has curly dark hair and a loud laugh. Amber, who's 23, has super straight blonde hair. She's so beautiful, it almost hurts my eyes. Tanya and Amber met in a class that's just called university. It's like a welcome to university program for students who've been out of school for a while. Mature students, they're called. I tag along when Amber, Tanya, and a bunch of their older friends go to the owl. I order orange juice so the bartender won't ask for ID. I'm sure I look like one of those puzzles for kids where you're supposed to circle the object that doesn't belong. An old creep pulls up a chair, Gary. I recognize him from the mature student computer lab where I meet up with Amber and Tanya when their classes are over. Gary's 40 and married and obnoxious as hell. He's foghorn loud and slamming back pints. Nice shirt, he crawls across the table and leers at my boobs, his voice dripping hostility like venom from a fang. What a lech. I glare at him. He laughs, raises his beer as if he's cheersing me, and takes a loud glug. Why are you friends with him? I ask Amber later. He's part of the group. Take it or leave it. Gary makes my skin crawl, but I'll just ignore him. No way am I giving up my only friends. Shortly after that, Gary sexually assaulted me. I spent the following years mostly in denial and then falling prey again and again to men who would do me harm. But a decade after Gary hurt me, I landed in the greatest relationship I could have imagined. And in this next passage here, I'm relaxing on the couch at my partner's place. I'm lying on the couch with my eyes closed when something hits my throat. I scream and clutch at the spot and my body convulses like Old Testament demon possession. Ian's holding a pair of folded black socks. I saw a vulnerability and flicked my socks at you. I'm shrieking and laughing and crying. I can't stop shaking. I'm sorry, Ian says, when I don't calm down. He pulls me into his arms, presses his lips against my hair and says a hundred times, you're okay, you're safe. Half an hour passes before I know it's true. I have so many weird things like that wrong with me. I can't pinpoint when they started, but it hasn't always been this way. In high school, I had a choker, a pretty black velvet necklace that I'd wrap tight around my throat. But now the thought of it freaks me out, makes me cry, convinces me I can't breathe. I have a twitch, a jolt in my left shoulder that shudders through me when I'm cold or afraid and even when nothing's wrong. I panic in elevators when the doors close and I hear other people breathing. I take the stairs instead, even 14 flights up, because I'm afraid I won't be able to keep from screaming. So I had a host of symptoms that developed after that assault, including showering in my sleep. I also became physically incapable of fighting back when I was with other men, and my body would, my body would just freeze, which is a classic symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so my illness magnified to the point that my life fell completely to pieces. Um, my relationship ended and I had to quit my job. I just couldn't manage, um, I just couldn't manage um, taking care of myself. And I spent a year doing absolutely nothing but looking after myself and my wounded mind. And so I did lots and lots of therapy during that time. And I also practiced a, an extreme amount of meditation. <laughs> And the following passage here is from a meditation retreat that I went on, and this was a few months into my recovery. I've been twitching every night for months now, but it's way worse on retreat. My spasms are lasting for hours and keeping me up long into the night. The electric shocks follow me everywhere, into the meditation hall, into the shower, during meals, and even on the hills where I run to escape them. I try meditating through my tremors and sit at the back, to keep from disturbing the others. It doesn't work. I can't stop my legs from rising and slapping down hard against the floor. 
I go to my room and lie on the carpet and let my legs fling themselves in the air. Later, during forgiveness practice, I replay everything I've done wrong. I failed Holly. I raged at my family. I broke Ian's tooth. I drove him away. I picked on Jenna and Tanil and on and on. I'm wrapped with shame. I'm sorry, I say to everyone I harmed. I'm sorry, so sorry, I say to myself too. I feel lighter, unbound, as if I'm Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, setting down his pack. I can't take back my mistakes, but I can forgive my long ago selves. They didn't know how to do better. Tears are still rolling down my cheeks when I realize my parents never meant to hurt me. I forgive them too. My heart is so big, it stretches out of my chest and fills the whole world. What about Gary? I feel him reach his arm around me. I forgive him. An electrical storm blasts through my body and sears me to the core. Fuck Gary. I run upstairs to a vast empty room. I lie on the floor, limbs stretched out, and surrender to the violence. It's like I'm in an electric chair, like I'm a marionette on fire. My whole body tenses up. My stomach contracts hard, pulling my legs and shoulders in tight like I'm doing crunches. There's an explosion, and my body shoots out long. It's still for a second. Then my legs go wild, shaking like clotheslines in a storm. It's time for lunch, and I'm starving, but there's no way I can make myself stand. I lie on my back and feel my body descend into the depths. My body goes crazy at home, too. It throws me against doors, walls, the back of my chair, the kitchen sink. Why aren't I better yet? I snap next time I walk into my therapist's office. I'm furious that I'm still so broken after six months of convulsions and ripping out my guts and staring them down. We can stop our sessions anytime you want, she says. I just want to be fixed. How much longer will it take? Unfortunately, I can't tell you that, she says. It's going to take as long as it takes. I'm crying, but I nod. I'll keep going even if I'm in therapy forever. I have to. Fine, but why is my body so psychotic? Are we making me worse? No, you're getting better. Your reactions are a normal part of the healing process, she says. When you froze, all the energy your body would have used to help you fight or run away was locked up inside you. Now that you're letting some of that trapped old energy out, it's like lifting the lid on a boiling pot. So the convulsions I described there, they came every single day for more than three years. I also had some violent urges <laughs> that came up too. And so I will admit to you that I murdered an awful lot of pillows. And at one point I also bashed some holes into my storage room wall. But along the way, as I lifted the lid on this boiling pot of trauma, um, I caught the occasional glimpse of peace as shown in the last passage I'll share with you. I try to hold still in the meditation hall. My cheek is incredibly itchy. I resist the urge to scratch and just pay attention to the sensation. It turns into burning. It flames for a moment and fades, leaving no evidence that it ever existed. Then a memory, Gary, a flash of anger. It ignites and burns in my belly. My face tenses, jaw tightens, brows furrow, rage grows inside and fills my body with heat. I ask myself, can this be okay? I open to the fire and let it move on its own without chasing it or scolding it away. The flames take over and I worry they'll consume me, burn me at the stake. But what about this moment? Can it be okay? I draw my attention back to the heat. It fades and passes away while I sit still and watch it leave. It passes away like the end of a day, like a toddler's first goldfish, like a leaf in the autumn, like grandparents, like fruit flies, like memories, like a flower that's been picked, like childhood and youth, like Ozymandias, like a worm that gets eaten by a bird that gets caught by a cat that gets hit by a car, like starving children across the world, like everything. The days weave together a million tiny moments that I despise or savor or simply notice one at a time as I fall deeper and deeper into silence and into God, which is just another word for love. So how am I now? I'm happier and healthier and better than I have ever been. My healing took three long years. It was excruciating, 
but it popped right out the other side. And I often catch myself looking around now at this new life that I get to have and just thinking about how lucky I am, um, both to be able to be better and to be able to share my story in hopes that it encourages other people in their own healing too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, so we'll uh, take a bit of time for questions. If, uh, if anyone has questions, please put them uh, in the Q&A. Um, so the first question is, I'm curious how the writing process was for DM. Was it therapeutic to tell her story or was it painful and triggering? Maybe both. Uh, it was absolutely both of those things. Um, I always process my feelings by writing. That's the easiest way that I do it. So when I started writing my story, I wasn't. I was just writing for me. I was just writing like here's my here's my journal, and it had been um, it had been really difficult. I was in denial for a long time, so it was really difficult for me to sit down and say this is what happened to me, and then not rip up the pages because that's what I had done in the past when I had um, when I had started writing things. Um, but it was really, really helpful for me to to write the story and to write it for myself and to write it kind of in real time as I was feeling. It was it was really helpful, um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for for other people. It kind of depends on on every individual what they're comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, a question for Marina. Um, I'm interested in the research that uh, you did while writing The Difference, this person said. Um, what was the most interesting part of writing about this sea voyage? I liked what DM said there about um, writing uh, to work your way through trauma. And I think that it's, uh, it's one of the real reasons that we write at all, that we start writing when we're young, for example. Um, certainly that we journal and Thank you for that insight, DM. Um, research for the difference took about uh, eight years of um, serious, serious research and a couple more years uh, of a little bit of research while I was writing. <laughs> I started out not knowing very much about anything and so I felt like I had to know a lot about everything uh, and um, research about how, to, how it was to live at sea was probably the most daunting thing for me. I felt like I couldn't really start. And I, as a kid, I had sailed little boats and I had been on, um, I'd been on larger boats, but only for an hour or so at a time, you know, on a, a, a pleasurable cruise out into the harbor. Uh, so I, um, I felt like I really had to spend a couple of nights at sea, at least before I would dare to write about being on a sea voyage that lasted eight months. So I uh, applied for a Killam grant at the University of Alberta for research money, and I got funded to go to the Caribbean and spend 10 days on a sailboat. <laughs> My husband said, don't tell Stephen Harper, who was still in charge at that time, that's how long ago it was, don't tell Stephen Harper that you got this grant. So I went and I was really scared, you know, I, I was actually quite chicken about uh, being on the boat. And I, I didn't feel like I would necessarily s suffer from from uh, seasickness, but I was still worried. And I, what if I fell off? I don't swim that well. So I phoned my sister who lives in California and said, you know, I'm just a bit scared about this. And she said, well, I got my bronze in life-saving. I'll come with you. So my sister came with me. And that was, was such a wonderful gift that she came with me. And don't tell her this, but some of Thea is kind of based on her. Um, her name is Tira. Uh, and it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, time to, to be able to see, see, the, see the ocean, see the world from sail instead of from always motors and engines as we are nowadays. And those, those 10 days of just being on the amazing Caribbean Sea really gave me such a boost into the book and 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 the experience of being on the ocean that I had that week and a half has lasted lasted all the way through the reading of the book the writing of the book I hope it lasts through the reading of the book as well thank you so much and uh, kind of a related question uh, somebody said the details of your work are exquisite Marina what resources did you use to nail the era so 
That's a good question too. And and working in historical fiction, it's always, uh, you know, I, I like DM, I work largely from memory, but I'm creating that memory. Um, and in this case, there, there was very traumatic memory involved because I wanted to write about residential schools. When I was first thinking about the book, well, the first instinct, the first uh, instigation towards the book was listening to a tape of my childhood piano teacher. She had told stories all through the time that I worked with her for seven years, but I never heard this story until about 1995. Uh, I googled her and what came up was a tape of her speaking about the honeymoon voyage that her mother had gone on and how her mother bought a little boy in the South Seas for four pounds of tobacco. And listening to that story, I just was so cold with a kind of shock and shame that this was, you know, no separation from me at all. This was my teacher's mother had done this thing so recently. And then I recognized that particular kind of shame as being how a lot of us in Canada feel about the treatment of resident of children in the residential schools in Canada and this this impotent um, shame and inability to do anything about what happened long ago and you know luckily is recently still not happening. So I was I was drawn to the story and wanted to think about it, but I also felt it was not I was I would not be able to do it. But then I went to New Zealand with the Commonwealth Writers Prize and on to Tonga afterwards and met. 150 school students and got to know some of them better and talked to them and you know joked with them and then it began to feel really cowardly not to try to examine how a woman not unlike me in her time could possibly think that it was okay to do this how she could even think it was a good deed it was benevolent so i did a lot of reading in the period religious tracts and um, philosophy of education, and of course, reading about residential schools. Oh, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's a question for both of you. Are you working on any new projects that you would be willing to share? Uh, I have a project that is a it's a baby still <laughs> so it's just the incubating so it's a little bit early to share about it um, but it's something I'm excited about and it also I'm the editor at a newspaper right now so I get to do a lot of writing still all the time in my in my regular job Marina what about you well funnily enough I'm writing about the time when I was a newspaper editor I was the editor of the Marathorpe Freelancer for a couple of years while living there on my husband's first posting with the RCMP. Marathorpe um, became well known to all of Canada later on, but when we lived there, it was just a butt ugly town in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there was a lot of shell shock in, in being taken there suddenly after, you know, having lived in cities all my life really. And, uh, so I'm, I'm writing a, a book based on our lives there in Marathorpe. Thank you. Um, these questions are great, everybody. So uh, this is awesome. Uh, the next question is, what do you, uh, do, it's for DM, what do you want people to take from your book, whether or not your readers have had similar experiences? What I want people to take from my book most is like hope that things can get better for them. So when I was when I was at the depths of my illness, I kept looking in all of these other books, all of these other memoirs, trying to find a story of someone like me who had endured something like this and who was able to get better from it. As I knew from like some clinical books that my that my therapist had shared with me, I had seen some case studies of here's someone who had a bad thing happen to them who got better. But he didn't know beyond that of someone's individual personal experience um, who was kind of stuck where I was. Like I said, it took me three years to get better. It was a long time to not know <laughs> if there was going to be a bright side for me. And so what I really want other people to know is that it, it gets better. It definitely gets better. And I want people to know that both um, both for the survivors themselves and for the people who, who love them and care about them. Um, because I think it's easy to... Um, 
maybe maybe baby our people <laughs> and not and not know that they can get better and not and not share resources with them and and help them and and hope that you can point them towards recovery as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think that came across but, um, in the book when, when I read it, it really, um, I, I found it for sure hard to, to read about the difference, but so uh, moving to read about the recovery. So thank you very much for writing it. Um, a question for uh, both of you, um, where's your favorite spot to write and what inspires you most to write? I don't know that I have a favorite spot. I write wherever I can and um, in whatever minutes I can find around all the other work that we have to do as writers in order to put food on the table. Bit of a depressing time. Um, so I write wherever. And uh, if I'm not physically writing with pen or, cu or, or computer, I can, uh, I can be thinking and imagining again and going through the characters' lives. But what, what inspires me to write is a really interesting question to me because it seems so different every time. I mean, uh, the things that have been the triggers or the inciting moments for my books have, have been each one completely different and completely separate. Um, but that initial spark, that little spark that makes you go, oh, I think I have to think about this for longer is a really, I love that moment where you, you think, oh, this has to be thought about, this has to be, I have to do something about this, or I just need to worry about that a little bit longer, or, so I told you what the uh, inspiration was for for the difference was this story of my, my piano teachers, and for the little shadows, it was, I was, uh, we all do everything else we can around the edges, and I was, I was uh, asked or really, properly told by a powerful woman in the town to write a history of the Anglican Church in Cochrane. And uh, she had connections to the Glenbow Museum, she, she one of the funders of it. And so I spent hours and hours and hours in the archives of the Glenbow Museum looking for stuff on this church to write the church history. Uh, but I would get mad every little while because I shouldn't have been doing that. I wasn't getting paid for it and I didn't have time to do it. And then I'd go look at theater stuff. And I found all these beautiful photographs of vaudeville. And I had no idea there was vaudeville in Canada at all. Um, so those photographs that I, you know, sort of snuck away and looked at really sparked off an interest in, in the story of how it was to be a vaudeville artist in the, at the turn of the century. And with good to a fault, it was that I saw this um, car crash happen. And I imagined what might have provoked the car crash and what would happen later to this woman with her, you know, her car registration in one hand and her license in the other and a neat little car and then the other car just chaos boiling out of it and how that was going to change her life forever. So I, I think that that little what sparks a story is a really interesting question to look at. Yeah. I agree that it's a really it's a really interesting question. Um, I think for me that what inspires me most to write is both love and pain. And then as as a reporter, um, I get to like I get to chat with a lot of people and I get to write um, like a lot of stories that that I choose. And what really what really compels me is just how interesting humanity is, right? That there's, <laughs> there's all of us are so interesting, and it's just really neat to me to get to sit down with someone and find out um, all the all the intricate little details about themselves and and why they are the way they are and why they love what they love. Um, and as far as where is my favorite place to write, um, it is in the least ergonomic position possible, <laughs> uh, on my pillow with my with my knees up. On, sorry, on my couch with my knees up and then cushions and then the laptop on top. But that is bad both for my body and for my laptop. So I do not advise it. I really wish we were not doing this on the ether, uh, but that we were in Moose Jaw. It would be so nice to be there with people in real life. I just moved to Saskatoon and I was so in, I was so looking forward to driving down from Saskatoon to Moose Jaw and having a really good time. So I'm pretty pissed off that we're having to do it this way, but I'm also glad that you guys have organized it so beautifully and it's uh, been really technically great from my end. 
Yes, uh, I totally agree. Thank you so much to the organizers for uh, doing the work to make it possible to still have a festival, but it would be nice to see each other in person for sure. And welcome to Saskatoon, Marina. I hope uh, we run into each other. Oh, are you a Saskatoonian? <laughs> I don't even know what we Saskatoonian. Um, so I think, uh, um, unless there are um, any questions that, that maybe you have for each other, is, is there, uh, not to put you on the spot too much, but if you happen to have a question for each other, we could uh, end with that. Uh, Donna, how long have you been a newspaper editor? Uh, it's very, it's only been a short time. I've only been the editor since January. Um, but I've been at the newspaper years now. Oh, have you? Well, congratulations on getting to be the editor. As if that's a big privilege. Where I know that actually just means you do way more work for less pay. <laughs> <laughs> less writing. <laughs> How did you get started writing? How did I get started writing? Um, well, I was an actor and um, I used to write long screeds about my characters. And uh, I was determined to be an actor. There was no question. That was in my mind since I was five. And then I got into it and, you know, it was actually quite awful and the life was horrible and you had to keep doing it even though you weren't really inspired anymore. And in theater school, my acting teacher at the end of year, the year when they give you, you know, you have a private interview and they tell you how terrible you are. And my acting teacher said, I don't know why you're thinking about being an actor. You should be a writer. I'm reading all this stuff you write about your character. Why don't you write? And I was just furious that she would think that because I was an actor. But then after a couple of years of doing it, I, I was, um, I wanted to do the other part. I wanted to do the creating part rather than the interpreting part. And then we moved to Marathorpe and I couldn't be in the theater anymore anyway. So I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you both so much. Uh, this was really a privilege to uh, to be part of and to get the chance to hear from both of you, uh, both your readings and your reflections on the questions that were really thoughtful. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, I, I also want to mention that um, if people are uh, looking to, to find the work of uh, these two fine authors and others from the festival, we really encourage people to do that, of course. Uh, and we especially encourage folks to uh, seek out uh, writing from, from festival authors from McNally Robinson, uh, as well as from uh, Post Horizon Books in Moose Jaw. Um, both of those booksellers are connected to the festival, and when you buy from festival authors from them, uh, a portion of the proceeds goes to the festival. So. We especially encourage folks to do that. Uh, thank you so much again, and thanks to everyone for uh, being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy.